Good afternoon. Um, I want to welcome everyone to our Forest Her NC virtual workshop. This is the beginning of a new series called Protecting Your Woods. So this is workshop one. Um, we'll be talking about trespassing issues, the Landowner Protection Act, and managing recreational leases. So we just thank everyone for taking time out of their day to join us and look forward to a great uh, webinar. So for those that have been with us before, welcome back. And those that are new, we're glad you could we're very happy to be here. Um, my name is Deanna Noble, and I'm a wildlife conservation biologist with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. Um, I'll be your moderator today, so I'll try to try to keep us on task, and maybe you can get back outside and enjoy the beautiful weather we're having today. We've been very fortunate. Let's see. Um, so we'd love to communicate here at Forest Her. Uh, we have a chat box and um, you know in the past we've asked folks you know where they're from but this time I want to do something a little different so if you could just type in your most recent management practice that that you've implemented on your property um, maybe it's prescribed burning or maybe you had a timber harvest um, you could have planted a pollinator garden or, you know, put up nest boxes just anything that you've worked on lately on your property and if you haven't Maybe it's something that you plan to implement soon. So just kind of want to get an idea of what you guys have been working on um, out on the land. And while we're doing that, I'm going to pass it over to Bob Barden with NC State Extension Forestry, and he's going to go over a little bit of the Zoom uh, housekeeping rules. All right. Thank you, Deanna. As Deanna indicated, I'm uh, Bob Barton, and I just want to point out a couple of the features of Zoom that we'll be using. Uh, I know several of you have participated before and heard this, but for those that are new, uh, we want to try to make this experience as, as best as possible for you. Uh, we're asking to uh, use the chat box uh, for technology issues or if the presenters or the host ask you to respond to something, feel free to type it in the chat box. Uh, you can bring up the chat box by clicking on the chat icon and that will launch a little window there for you. And it's just like texting, uh, you can type in that chat window and hit send and we'll be able to see it. Uh, if you have a question for the presenter as they're going through their topics today, we ask that you enter those questions into the Q&A feature of Zoom. That's also a little icon that should be at the bottom of your screen. Click on the Q&A, enter your question, and we will address those questions um, either shortly at the end of, for a couple minutes at the end of the, each presenter's talk, or after the whole webinar, we will um, try to get through those also. Uh, we do have closed captioning today. If you need that feature, uh, you can turn that on by clicking on closed captioning there um, at the bottom of your screen. If you need to get our attention, uh, feel free to raise your hand and we will respond to you. If it's something that you can type in the chat, we ask that you do that, but go ahead and raise your hand and that will bring it to our attention uh, if you're having technology issues or something like that. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Deanna. All right, thank you so much for uh, going over that with us. Hopefully everybody's now familiar with how, how this webinar is gonna run. So if you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and so after each presentation, we're gonna have an option if we have time for uh, five minutes of questions. And if we don't, we'll have the Q&A session here at the end. So um, hopefully we'll get, get to all your questions today. And like I said, just feel free to reach out. Don't be shy. So we got two great speakers today. Uh, we're gonna to start off with Barbara Smith. She is an enforcement officer with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. And she's gonna be talking about the North Carolina landowner. So Barbara, if you wanna take the screen from me or I'll stop sharing. All right. Hello, everybody. I am the officer stationed in Onslow County, and I work Onslow, Jones, Lenore, and Duplin. So I'm on the eastern part of the state. Um, 
if anybody is familiar with what I do, um, I handle all your hunting, fishing, boating, and trapping uh, laws and um, trespassing and Land Under Protection Act fall into those categories. Uh, I'm hopefully will answer some of your questions and can assist you with some issues that you might be having. And uh, as we go throughout this presentation, so I'm just glad everyone could be here today and I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, the Land Under Protection Act. So the Land Under Protection Act provides two ways for landholders to post their lands to allow only hunters, trappers, and anglers with written permission to legally enter their property. As permitted in the past, the landholder can place notices or signs or posters on the property boundaries at a distance of 200 yards apart or closer. And then a new way to post the land is with the purple paint. Um, the landowner can paint a vertical line of purple paint on trees or posts around the property boundary or areas intended to prohibit trespass. And the reason for the purple paint is because a lot of people have issues with um, their signs getting destroyed or torn down. And so the state of North Carolina came up with a new way to post your property that will hopefully last longer. This is an example of what your purple line should look like. The paint line needs to be at least eight inches long and the bottom of the line should be between three and five feet from the base of the tree or post. The paint marks need to be placed 100 yards apart or closer. So these are just some examples of um, what the purple paint looks like. These aren't from the same piece of land. You can use purple paint and posted signs together. Um, that's fine too, whatever, whatever works best for you. So with the um, Land Under Protection Act, sportsmen need written permission dated within the past 12 months signed by the landowner or leasee to hunt, fish, or trap on lands posted with signs or purple paint. You must carry the written permission on your person. If a hunting club has leased the land, hunters must have a copy of their hunting club membership and a copy of the landowner permission given to that club. So in, a lot of people have a question about specifically what needs to go on the form to comply with written permission requirements of the Landowner Protection Act you may use any form that provides at least the following information, the landowner or leaseholder's name, the sportsman's name, and it has to be dated within the last 12 months. And then we have a permission slip on our website and I'm gonna pull it up for you to look at real quick. So this is, um, you know, a printable version of a landowner permission form, and it has um, multiple, you can print this one page, and it is two different um, permission forms. So you just say you're the landowner, and you are allowing someone else to hunt or fish on your property. You would just fill out this and um, date and sign it, and then that person that is gonna be on your property has to carry this um, written permission with them. Okay, so what makes this law special? So wildlife officers in the past, when then we get a trespassing call, a lot of times we have to go through a lot of checking, trying to find out who owns the land and then um, getting up with that landowner and figuring out if they want that person on their land and um, if they want to charge with trespassing. So the Landowner Protection Act has greater strength than just the regular trespassing because 
if your property is properly posted with the purple paint, if we encounter someone hunting or fishing or trapping on that property, then automatically they have to have that rent permission on their person. If they don't, then we don't have to go through the extra steps of trying to contact the landowner and um, find out if they're legally allowed to be there. We can go ahead and charge them under the Landowner Protection Act. The Landowner Protection Act does not change general trespass laws nor have any effect on lands which are not posted. It does not repeal any local acts currently in effect that require written permission to hunt, fish, or trap. North Carolina law encourages owners of land to make property available for recreational use. The law states that a landowner who allows someone without charge onto their land for recreational purposes owes them the same duty of care they would owe a trespasser. So just, I thought this was kind of funny. <laughs> um, as a landowner, you cannot harm trespassers. To avoid, so we get that question a lot. Um, you know, can you shoot someone that's trespassing on your property? No, you cannot. Um, you can call law enforcement or you can uh, contact that individual and find out what they're doing um, and, you know, go from there. But you cannot shoot someone or harm someone just because they're on your property. Avoid liability. The law only requires that the landowner avoid willful or wanton injury to the trespasser. If not properly posted, position may be implied and that would change the landowner's position in liability. So chapter, uh, general statute uh, chapter 38 deals with landowner liability, except as specifically recognized by or provided for in this act. An owner of land who either directly or indirectly invited or permits without charge any person to use such land for educational or recreational purposes owes that person the same duty of care that he owes a trespasser, except nothing in this act shall be construed to limit or nullify the doctrine of attractive nuisance. So landowners need to advise guests of artificial or unusual hazards. And that's just saying, so if you have a piece of property that you're allowing people to hunt on and you know that they have to, you know, cross a field with a, a bull in it, that's kind of temperamental, or maybe you have an unused well on your property that there's a giant hole in the ground that might, you know, when you go into hunt, you do it at dusk and uh, dawn. So it, in low light situations, you may not be able to see certain hazards. Just as a landowner, you need to make people aware of hazards that may be on your property. So you have second degree trespass. A person commits the offense of second degree trespass if without authorization, they enter or remain on premises of another after they've been told uh, not to enter or remain there by the owner, by a person in charge of the premises or by a lawful occupant or by another authorized person that are posted in a manner reasonably likely to come to the attention of intruders with notice not to enter the premises. And second degree trespass is a class three misdemeanor. So second degree, second degree trespass works in the manner, if you as a landowner tell, you catch someone on your property and you tell them, you know, I don't want you here anymore. Don't come back. Um, at that point, if you have notified that individual that you don't want them on your property. And if you catch them on your property again, you can go down to your local magistrate's office and take out a warrant for secondary trespass on that person. That um, criminal summons will uh give you some legal action at that point that person will be served that and they would have to appear in court and you would have a case against them you know so if you do encounter someone on your property you need to take notes about the conversation that you had what date it was what time it was and then that way you have documented that you have told this person not to be on your property and if you encounter them again on your property, then it gives you um, 
substantial evidence to uh, take out charges against them. So injury to trees, crops, and lands of another. Any person not being on his own land who shall without the consent of the owner thereof willfully commit any damage, injury, or spoliation to or upon any tree, wood, underwood, timber, garden crops, vegetables, plants, lands, springs, or any other matter or thing growing or being thereon cuts, breaks, injures, or removes any tree, plant, or flower shall be guilty of a class one misdemeanor. So I'm not sure if um, you all are uh, aware of our misdemeanors, but a class one is right underneath a felony charge. So it's a, the most severe misdemeanor that you can be charged with. Class three is the, you have infractions, which are like speeding tickets, and then your misdemeanor start. And you have uh, class three, class two, and then class one, and then start your felonies. So if someone, you know, like this vehicle is driven all through this uh, farmer's crops, they can be charged with the class one misdemeanor for damage to those crops, because that's lost um, money for that farmer. So attractive nuisances. In North Carolina, a landowner and or occupier will be liable for harm to a child that is sustained if the child was attracted to the dangerous condition or area due to the child's expected curiosity. An attractive nuisance is a condition that is highly dangerous to children who are trespassers. North Carolina has developed the rule of sevens when determining if a child is negligent or contributory negligent. So what to do about attractive nuisances, you can remove them or you can um, fence them off so that they are not accessible to young children. And this is things like swimming pools, ponds, um, any kind of large amounts of debris that are piled up. Uh, this picture in the bottom uh, right hand corner is of an old well that is not in use anymore. All right, gating and limiting access. Gates deter people from enter, entering your property. And you can get gates at local hardware stores, farm supply stores, and online gate companies. Uh, gates are likely to be more secure than cables or chains and gates should be placed in view of a main road to uh, avoid vandalism. Locks should, locks should be substantial enough to withstand weather and vandalism. So this is a picture of a gate um, going into a hunting club. You can see they've placed the gate um, right at this where the trees start so that um, a four wheeler or dirt bike is not going to be able to get around this gate. Um, and that's the ideal situation. This gate, this picture was taken right off of a main road. So you can see this gate from the road which is ideal. If there are no natural barriers, like um, a lot of people will put a gate up and then they'll have ditches that run uh, parallel to the gate. So once again, your um, ATVs and your side-by-sides and dirt bikes wouldn't be able to get around the gate. Um, your gates should be highly visible, especially at night, so that no one accidentally slams into them. You can put light reflecting tape and paint on them. Um, you don't want anyone to get injured on your gate. So those um, big metal gates that we were just looking at are are costly. Um, if you have a large tract of land that requires multiple gates, you know, you may not want to, or you may can't invest a whole bunch of money in those type of gates. So while I don't typically recommend um, cables or chains uh, just because of liability purposes, it, if you choose to use that, you need to enclose it in some type of PVC pipe 
or something that will make it safer um, in the instance that it, if it's run into, it's not going to injure or kill somebody. Cables and chains, they're a less expensive option, um, but they have been known to cause injuries and fatalities. Um, so if you think about how fast like a four wheeler goes, if someone slams into that cable, it's really gonna do some damage to their neck and face. Um, and you don't wanna be in that situation. You don't wanna harm anyone. Um, I know sometimes trespassing issues are frustrating, but at the end of the day, you definitely don't wanna be responsible for someone's death. Um, this is a picture that shows a good example of someone. They have, uh, they have a cable across their entryway but they've put a PVC pipe across the whole entire thing. It's also posted on the right-hand side. There's also a posted sign on the left-hand side, but that got cut off in the picture. You see on the right-hand side, they have a complete tree line. So you, so no one can get, you know, on a four wheeler or vehicle, you can't get around that. And then on the left-hand side, there's a ditch right there. It's a little bit grown up, but you still wouldn't be able to, to get around that. And I keep referring to um, ATVs and dirt bikes and things like that because a lot of the trespassing calls that I get are from people that are riding illegally on other people's property. Of course, you always are going to have people that are walking onto your property, um, which causes a little bit, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot to do. There's not a whole lot of ways to stop someone from walking onto your property, and that's where posting your property correctly comes into play. So you have visual and structural barriers. Um, you can, uh, you know, a lot of your farm fields will have ditches um, that create uh, a natural barrier. You can plant trees. Um, this is especially helpful if you have a big wide open field, um, especially for like in terms of poaching. If you have a big wide open field and you know that there's a lot of deer and turkey in your fields, you should plant some kind of natural barrier um, to block the view from the road. A lot of the calls that I get are where people pull up in vehicles, shoot from the vehicle, uh, you know, shoot the deer or the turkey, run out there and grab them and, and uh, put them in the vehicle, which all of that's very illegal. But if the, if the person driving on the road cannot see into your field, it helps greatly reduce the risk of um, animals being poached out of your fields. All right, so boundary lines. Finding the corners is typically the only way many landowners can mark their boundaries, functional for residential um, landowners, but not owners of large tracts of forests. As a forest landowner, establishing and maintaining well-marked uh, lines can save you money, liability, and litigation. Selling timber entails a precise location of the sales boundaries to conduct a legal and legitimate transaction. And then um, subdivision or property transfer. Each time a property is sold, transferred, or subdivided, a survey must be conducted by a registered land surveyor to verify the location, extent, and boundaries of the property. So I'm not sure if anybody has uh, had large amounts of land surveyed, but it gets very costly quickly. Many land parcels carry restrictions on the placement of buildings, setbacks for fences or other limits on development. Locating the exact property lines can help an owner comply with restrictions. Timber harvesting, site preparation and prescribed burning operations must be conducted within the confines of one's property. Clearly defined property lines will help avoid conflicts and potential encroachment on adjoining lands. Unwanted trespass and poaching can be minimized by marking and posting property lines. A way to reduce vandalism is to not make your property easily accessible and there um, use gated entryways. 
Unmarked property boundaries can lead to a loss of land, land boundaries that are uncontested for a period of as little as seven years can lead to loss of land from the original owner. Timber theft, unmarked property can be susceptible to timber theft, timber trespass. The best protection against timber theft is a well-marked and maintained boundary line that is frequently checked for encroachment. Landowners can prevent timber theft on their property by taking proactive measures such as contacting the North Carolina Forest Service County Ranger and having a forest management plan prepared. Rangers can not only prepare the plan, but they also offer information on their subjects such as sustainable forest management. They provide contact lists of loggers, timber buyers, and consulting foresters. You can also, as a landowner, hire a private consulting forester who can also write a management plan for you. And then um, just remember, if someone illegally logs on your property, it's very hard to catch them once they leave the property and it's very hard to determine your financial loss um, and, and it's hard to recover that. Property ownership comes with many responsibilities and obligations um, to invited and uninvited users. Well marked or posted boundaries can help minimize landowner liability, especially in the case of recreational and trail use where no fees are exchanged. So these are just uh, examples of types of tree boundary markings. Um, the first one is survey marks or hacks on trees. And uh, this just indicates where the property may have been surveyed. The second picture is a centerline tree and they're painted with a two by six inch vertical mark at the point that the tree intersects the property line. And then the next one is actually our game lands um, boundary line and the tree indicating a directional change. They re um, receive a double three inch by four inch wide band painted on the side of the tree to which the property line changes direction. And then corner trees located within five foot of the corner receive a triple two inch wide band on the side of the tree directly facing the corner stake or post. So some ways to deter trespassers. Um, trail cameras are a great tool to use. And now um, there are cell cameras, which if they have good enough signal, will send a picture straight to your smartphone to let you know that someone is on your property. Uh, you can possibly use motion activated lights and um, just another Reminder, you know, this example is of a posted sign, but this posted sign is in poor condition. So make sure you keep your posted signs updated and visible. And I'm pretty sure everybody's seen posted signs that are worn or torn in half or so faded you can't read them. Your posted signs need to be in good quality. So dumping, keeping your property properly posted and controlling access points will deter unwanted dumping. Um, it's, it's sort of like if your property is very easy to drive onto, then it makes an ideal location for lazy people to dump their unwanted trash on your property. Um, the easiest way to deter this is to put up some sort of barrier so that they cannot drive to your property. Um, also, you know, cameras, uh, your, your trail cameras will help um, catch people doing this. Remember when you're putting up a trail camera to try to catch someone that's dumping on your property, uh, you want to put it in an area so that they can't easily see it, but you also want to put it so that you might can get a vehicle tag number because that's really what you need in order to be able to identify who that person is. Okay, so some people own property that is not, you know, you have to cross someone else's property or go down a lane to get to that property. 
So easement um, is defined as the right to use another's property for a specific purpose. An easement on your property does not mean that someone owns part of your property. Parties will be able to access or use your property for a specific reason. And that specific reason would be to access their property. Uh, right of way is defined as easements that specifically grant the holder the right to travel over another's property. While the right of way provides a legal right to cross the land, it does not give the holder any ownership rights to the right of way. And that is it. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing, Barbara. A lot of good information. And I think we have several questions for you here. So we'll just start going through these um, and get as many as we have time to do before the next speaker. So what is the legal line if you have an old cemetery on your land and people trespass to either one, bury new bodies without your permission, this is an old personal cemetery, not public, or two, they come to visit the graves or weed eat also without permission. There's a liability for us if someone is injured, not to mention we don't want any more additions to the cemetery. So I would say um, this is probably more of an attorney question. There are some laws in North Carolina um, about uh, like if, uh, if the access road to that cemetery has been used for years and years and years to access that cemetery, then there's not a whole lot you're gonna be able to do to stop people from maintaining that cemetery. Um, a lot of landowner conflicts can be resolved if you just um, you know, try to communicate with the the person who's maintaining the cemetery, um, you know, and just talk to them about maybe letting you know when when they're going to be there. Um, but that would be more of a, an attorney question. I, you know, I can't. I can only answer so many questions, and then, you know, I know a lot about uh, Land Owner Protection Act and things like that, but as far as like cart path laws and right of way laws and things like that, you may need to, to contact an attorney. Okay. Here's another one. If I have several tracks under two names, do I need to put purple paint only around the combined land or each parcel separately? Well, it depends on, um, you know, what, what you're hoping to do with that property. If you don't want people on that property, then you need to post the whole thing, um, you know, the whole boundary line. So the, as I said before, the purple paint uh, stops people from entering your property for the purposes of hunting, fishing, and trapping without written permission. Um, it doesn't necessarily apply to someone who's walking their dog on your property that would fall more under your um, basic trespass law. So, um, but yeah, if, if you don't want people hunting, fishing, or trapping on your property, then you need to post the entire boundary. Okay. So what can you do if you tell a trespasser to leave and they don't? Just call the sheriff? It depends on the type of trespassing. If it's for hunting, fishing, or trapping, then you need to call the game warden. And then if it's just regular trespass, then you can call the sheriff's department. Okay. How can you properly post a field that crosses property boundaries that is being actively farmed where posts would interfere in the farming operation and trees are not present to mark with purple paint? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, yeah, it, it, that is a good question. You know, I, you might could, um, you know, drop a post in the ground, um, you know, talk with the farmer and see if it would interfere with the farming operation. 
is there any kind of ditch line that maybe you could drop post near? Um, you know, a lot of your, a lot of properties are separated by creeks or, or little runs or ditches. So maybe, um, you know, if you have some sort of natural barrier that separates the line or something like that, you could put posts close to that so that they wouldn't be in the way of the farming operation. Yeah, that's a good point. Have you ever heard of a diamond shaped yellow sign that says no ATVs and no cutting? I thought I had a photo of the sign, but it's not by North Carolina agency. Is it enforceable? Maybe a forestry service sign, but not, but it's on private property I have access to hunt on. Uh, I'm not familiar with a sign like that. Yeah. All right, let's see if we got time for another one. Yeah, I think we're good on time. What do we do if we have trespassers on our land that is adjacent to a lake that does, that does allow public fishing? I know there's a strip of land that the state maintains at the waterline. However, we have horseback riders use this as an entrance to our land to ride around once they access. So I guess the people at the lake are filtering over onto their property. Okay. Um, so I guess I have a couple questions. Is your is the property posted at all um, against no trespassing? Has the landowner talked with any of the horseback riders to tell them to stay off the property? Has the landowner um, spoken with the other landowner who owns the lake and you know tried to just resolve the issue with them? Um, that would be a couple of things that I would would suggest. Mm -hmm. Do you need written permission on unmarked private property in order to hunt? So if the property is not no, marked. No, you do not. Okay. Yeah, no. Well, let's see. I think that's most of them. Let's see. Oh, here we go. I have property that is adjacent to wildlife land and have had a daily problem with trespassing. We have permanent metal signs, cameras, gates, purple paint. Is there anything else we can do? <laughs> <laughs> They're trying everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I mean, if the property line is properly um, posted, the only thing that you can, you know, a lot of people are, are run into a lot of times that uh, landowners don't want to charge the person that's trespassing on their property. Um, sometimes I think that this is a mistake. I think, I feel like, you know, if you've told someone to stay off your property and then you catch them again on your property, you should, you should take action at that point. You should, you know, either, if it's for hunting, fishing, or trapping, you should either call, you know, a wildlife officer and have them address it. Or if it's just regular trespass, then you should go down to the magistrate and take out a criminal warrant for these people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times just telling, telling someone something, some people are kind of hard headed. So if you tell them the first time and then they do it again, then you know you you should do something at that point that's going to make a difference right does the landowner protection act interfere with the farm liability protection law the landowner protection act is specific to um the hunting fishing and trapping on lands of another so i'm not familiar with the Farming law, um, I, I, you know, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Did you say that someone can legally shoot from their car into your property at game and go into your property and retrieve that game? I said that they cannot do that. That is very illegal. It's illegal in North Carolina to hunt with the aid and use of a motor vehicle. 
And that goes back to, you know, if you can try to screen off your property to discourage any of that uh, from taking place. If you live next door to posted property and you see someone trespassing saying they have permission to be there, can you as a private citizen request to see the form giving them permission? This happened recently to my son-in-law. Can you repeat the question, Deanna? Yes, yeah, so if you live next door to property that's posted and you see someone trespassing on that property saying that they have permission to be there, can you as a private citizen request to see their permission form? Sure, I mean, you can. They might tell you to go pound sand. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you, you can ask. All right, let's do one more. In order to protect ourselves as landowners, if we have a fence, but not all the way around our land, but we do post it or paint it, are we protected if others trespass? We don't want anyone hurt, but if we are not there all the time, we don't know who is on the property. Right, and that um, it does uh, it does help um, to mark your boundaries. Like I, I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, basically you don't owe a trespasser. Um, you know, you don't owe them anything if they trespass on your property and get injured that is on them at that point. You have more, uh, more of a leg to stand on as far as liability goes. Also, if your property is posted against trespassing. So it's, you know, if, if you know the person, your property's posted, it says no trespassing, they trespass on your property, they end up, you know, breaking their leg and then they try to sue you. You may have to go to court at that point because it's a civil suit, but your liability is lessened by the fact that you have your property posted against trespassing. All right, well, we may have not have gotten to all of them, but for those that we didn't get to, if you can stay on afterwards, we'll have um, 30 minutes at the end of the workshop to um, try to catch up on all these questions. But thank you so much, Barbara. Mm -hmm. All right, our next speaker is Sierra Ward. She is a district manager with Resource Management Services and she is going to talk to us about managing recreational leases on your land. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks, Deanna, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for asking me to be a, a part of the panel and a part of the Forest Her group. Um, those of you who have been to previous Forest Hers, um, you may have heard me speak, I believe it was year before last, um, in Kinston. Uh, so obviously this is a little different uh, venue, but effective nonetheless, hopefully. Um, so real quick, uh, my name is Sierra Ward, and I am the White Oak District Manager for RMS here in Eastern North Carolina. Uh, like Barbara, I am also in Onslow County, um, so go Eastern North Carolina. Um, I am an operational, hands-on, production-oriented forester. Um, so I work in the woods uh, with loggers and site prep contractors, and I have been doing that for the last 15 years. Um, as it relates to this topic of uh, managing recreational leases, um, I have been and currently do uh, manage recreational leases on eight, about 80,000 acres here in Eastern North Carolina. So on top of overseeing all the things that go on in my district, um, I'm a member of several forestry boards um, and associations and and those memberships have really helped me to learn about and understand the business side of forestry, which helps me make better decisions in my management. So there's a little, little background about me. In the interest of time, I'm gonna kind of go through this slide really quick. Um, I've been with RMS for four years. Prior to that, I was with Warehouser Company for 11. Um, 
RMS, we are not consultants. Uh, we are at TIMO, which is a Timberland Investment Management Organization. And long story short, we invest in and manage Timberland uh, for a financial return for our clients, uh, most of whom are large institutional investors, uh, like pension funds, endowments, and whatnot. Like all right, so let's dive into the topic. Um, managing recreational leases on your property. I'll start by mentioning, um, you know, many folks refer to these as hunting leases, uh, but I purposefully titled this uh, recreational leases because uh, there's really a lot more to it than just hunting. Um, hunting is a huge part of leasing your land, maybe the biggest part, um, but depending on where you are, what amenities your property offers, um, you may have a lot of other options outside of just hunting. Um, here's a, a quick overview of, of what I'll present this afternoon. Uh, I'm hoping it at least hits the high points and uh, helps to inform you a little bit about leasing your property, uh, whether or not you're already doing it. So why lease your property? What are some of the reasons? Uh, what can you lease? And we'll delve into that in some detail in some future slides. Who can you lease to? That'll depend somewhat on what you're leasing and where you're located. How do you create a lease and what should be in it? Uh, and who can help? Um, I'll wrap up by pointing out some challenges and considerations and uh, sharing some experience from my years uh, managing recreational leases, if we have time. So additional income uh, is likely the biggest reason why folks would choose to lease their property for recreation. Um, here in North Carolina, um, you can expect to earn rates between five and $25 per acre, depending on the size and the location of your property um, and the amenities and the habitat that it provides. Um, you know, that these are, these are just examples, um, but you know, something like a 10,000 acre pine plantation forest in the east probably going to bring in you know, somewhere around $5 an acre uh, versus a 500 acre mixed pine hardwood property that's surrounded by farm fields, say in Bertie County, uh, where the deer are bigger and more sought after, uh, you, you could easily earn 15, maybe $20 per acre. Um, these are estimates again, and uh, a good way to determine or figure out what your property might be worth um, one thing, talk to your neighbors, uh, find out what they're leasing their land for. Uh, uh, probably a better way is to talk to your consulting forester. Um, he or she can help give you some guidance on how much you should be able to lease your property for. Um, and All right, so Barbara went over this in detail. It was really, really great information. Um, and another thing to consider about, or another reason to lease your property that can be especially valuable if you are an absentee landowner or if you have a really large property um, is when people pay to lease your property, they're gonna help keep trespassers, uh, poachers, vandals off your property. Um, if, if someone is paying good money to use your property, um, they're not going to want a bunch of random people driving or walking around on the property, disturbing the wildlife, uh, damaging the property, um, or damaging their hunting stands or their food plots or other amenities that might be there. So most leaseholders um, will actually help, help you by painting and posting your property if it's not already painted and posted. Um, so that can be a little bonus for you. Um, also, just by their sheer presence on your property, they're helping identify potential issues. You know, if there's trespass issue, dumping, uh, if there's a washout on a road or a culvert that needs to be replaced or a bug spot. You know, if you don't live on or near your property, these leases can be your eyes, your ears, and your boots on the ground um, to help you understand what's going on with the property. And oftentimes these folks, uh, they'll be glad to help you with projects, maybe like fence line clearing, food plot installation, roadside mowing, um, even things like road maintenance. 
you can even tailor make your lease to address your expectations. And if you communicate your forest management goals to your leasees, um, oftentimes you'll find people that want to help. Um, you may even be able to make an agreement and offer a lower dollar per acre rate in return for a particular number of hours of manual labor, uh, work days, particular number of miles or uh, feet of road maintained. So the options are really endless. Um, another reason to lease your property is to provide folks, um, just to provide that opportunity uh, to enjoy outdoor recreation. Um, you know, the average person doesn't own timberland, but many people really enjoy the opportunity to get out and, you know, get out in the woods, hunt, hike, go camping, um, do the things that they may have done with their grandparents or with their cousins growing up. Uh, so if you deal with hunters for very long at all, you'll learn uh, pretty quickly that uh, that heritage runs really deep. And it can be neat to be part of continuing that family tradition and having folk, folks uh, teach their kids about the outdoors. So if you think of your property ownership as basically owning a bundle of rights on that property, um, unless they're somehow restricted by a conservation easement um, or something like that, um, you own all those rights, that bundle of rights on your property. And they may include the right to harvest timber, mine minerals, develop the property, and certainly recreate upon the property. Um, so it's important to note that as the owner of those rights, you can choose to lease out any or all of them as you see fit. Um, or as is appropriate for your property. But before you can decide uh, what you're going to lease, you need to understand what is on your property. Uh, do you have a bunch of deer, turkey, uh, quail, perhaps? Uh, maybe you've got a system of old fire lines or logging roads that would make uh, really good hiking trails or horseback riding trails. Maybe you have a pond where people can fish um, or a natural spring. Um, chances are you probably have a pretty good idea of what game, what non-game species you have on your property and whether or not you have anything special or distinguishing um, that's kind of an amenity of the property that would bring value to someone that would want to lease it. If you aren't all that familiar with your property, North Carolina Wildlife Commission or the Forest Service or your consultant forester um, would be the perfect place to start. Uh, those folks can help you identify the attributes of your property that would be appealing to someone who would want to do a recreational lease. So uh, this is just, you know, recreational leasing is just one of the many sections that can and should be included in the forest management plan. Um, so now we've talked a little bit about uh, what rights we can lease. Let's talk about the kinds of leases you might enter into. Um, so, like I said, you can lease any or all of your recreational rights on your property. Uh, probably the most common type of lease is the all-inclusive recreational rights uh, lease. And so that one's going to give the leasee rights to all recreational activities on your property, unless you otherwise specify in the lease, which you can, can and should do like. So you can specify your lease as a hunting lease, uh, giving the leasee only the rights to hunt. And furthermore, you can even specify the game species that they're allowed to hunt or the season that they're allowed to hunt. So maybe you want to lease out uh, deer hunting, but you want to keep the turkey hunting for yourself and your grandkids. That's, that's no problem at all. Just specify that in your lease and you're good to go. Um, while it's less common, um, it's still perfectly acceptable to lease only very specific recreational rights. Um, so let's say like camping or horseback riding, hiking. Those kinds of leases aren't going to bring the same amount of money per acre as a more inclusive lease would. Um, and they're going to require a little bit more oversight on your part, uh, namely to make sure that, that the folks that are leasing are only partaking of those um, activities which you have leased. But 
that may be the right thing to do, depending on your property and the amenities that you have or, or where you're located or what your objectives are. All right, so who, who do you lease to? Um, when it comes to figuring out who to lease to, there are a few things that you should consider. Um, you can lease to local people, maybe even um, a neighbor or maybe an existing club on a neighboring property. Uh, that's a good bet for folks who are already gonna be familiar with the property. They're gonna be familiar with the area. They'll probably know if there's any contentious issues or sensitive areas. And if a neighboring club is willing to uh, expand, you know, they wanted to get bigger and, and lease more land, um, you, can, you can bet they're probably a solid club from a financial standpoint. So that's good. You can also lease to out-of-towners. Um, and oftentimes, you know, folks from big cities, Raleigh, Charlotte, you know, they want, they want a little quiet country getaway. To, to come to now and again. And more than likely, uh, leasing to out-of-towners versus a neighbor um, or a neighboring club is going to bring in a little bit more money. Um, but consider the trade-offs when you do that. Uh, the folks that are coming from out of town, they're not going to be familiar with the property. Uh, and they're probably not going to use your property every weekend like the guy down the road would. Uh, so they're not going to be exerting the same presence, those eyes, ears, boots on the ground that I talked about that help keep the trespassers and, and vandals off the property. Uh, they're not going to be there quite as often, but maybe that's what you want. You know, if, if you can get a lease and someone's going to pay you 15 bucks an acre and they're only going to hunt two or three weekends, um, if that works out for you, that's, that's great. Uh, so there's a lot of different aspects to consider um, when deciding who you're going to target, who you're going to market your lease to. So another thing to consider is the length of the lease that you're going to enter into. Um, most common are long-term leases, and those are typically annual, although they can be multi-year leases as well. And a long-term lease like that is going to minimize the paperwork for you. Um, it's going to set a timeline that's easy to understand. So if you say it's you know, January 1st through December 31st. So, you know, it's a calendar year and it's easy. Uh, you can also run your lease concurrent with uh, the season of the game that the leasee wishes to hunt. Um, so say you want to write a lease that, uh, that runs concurrent to Western deer season. So that starts on September 12th and ends January 1st. And you might offer that lease for 2021 through 2024. So into a three-year lease during Western deer season. That's, that's totally appropriate. Um, you know, turkey season is, is after deer season, April through May. So you and your grandkids would be free to hunt turkeys if you've only leased out the, the deer. So, uh, there are multiple ways that, that you can tailor make your lease uh, to make it fit your specific needs. And short-term leases are also an option. And, you know, we may consider those more of a permit than a lease uh, because it's a really short time, maybe just daily or weekly. And that could be, you know, again, for something like horseback riding or camping, hiking. But consider that shorter, more specific leases are, that's going to require more paperwork, more oversight on your part. Uh, but it could still be a good option. In any of these cases, though, um, you will need a legal lease document that outlines the terms of the lease, um, any specific rules or restrictions that you might have, and also insurance requirements. Uh, Barbara touched a little bit on liability, and that's, that's, that's a big thing when it comes to leasing your property. Uh, but you have to have them get that liability insurance to protect yourself as a landowner. Um, so there are a lot of um, sample leases that are available online that you can download. And I've got some uh, links at the end of the presentation. Um, or you can use a lawyer and, and draw one up from scratch if you want. You can keep it simple, but you absolutely must have a legally binding lease document. 
just in case things go sideways, it helps protect you. So your lease document um, needs to include a map of your property. That's, that's how the leasees know where your boundaries are. Uh, it should include reference of that uh, liability insurance that names you um, or your trust, your LLC, whoever, as additional insured. And most traditional hunt clubs are gonna be really familiar with that uh, insurance requirement. So it's, it's not gonna be a shock to them. Um, but different groups, smaller groups, maybe a bird watching group or something, they may not be as familiar with obtaining liability insurance for the group. So that, that may be a little bit more challenging. But again, you should, you should insist uh, that your leasees carry liability insurance. Okay, so that's a lot to consider uh, with regards to leasing your land. Um, who can help? You know, uh, my first suggestion would be to talk to your consulting forester. Um, if you don't have one, I recommend you get one. Um, for those of you who were on um, two months ago, maybe back in February, uh, Mr. Dave uh, Holly spoke about the ACF, the Association of Consulting Foresters. And their website is a really great resource uh, to find a consultant in your area. And most consultants can help you develop uh, not only your forest management plan, but they can also help you manage your recreational lease potential and actually manage the lease itself. Most, most consultants are gonna offer uh, recreational lease management as part of the package of services that they provide to you as their client. So a lot of them will already have a ready-made lease document that you can tailor make to your property. Uh, they are familiar with liability insurance. They are plugged in, so to speak. So they're gonna know um, what the going rate should be for your, for your lease rates. Uh, and most importantly, they're gonna know your property. They're gonna know what you have. Uh, they're going to know what kinds of activities or what kinds of amenities you should focus on with your lease. Your consultant might even handle um, the paper, all the paperwork. They might handle collecting the lease fee, uh, all of that. So that's that could be a, a really, really good way to go. Uh, a relatively new development that's come out in the last, let's say, five or ten years um, are these online lease management companies. Um, I have two listed here, Outdoor Access and Hunting Locator. Um, and there are other smaller, um, sort of privately owned, more localized companies that, that provide the same management, lease management service. Uh, I've not used any of these companies. I'm not familiar with them. I don't endorse any particular one. Uh, but the way they work seems pretty slick. Um, you post your lease and you include a description, maps, rules, uh, amenities, expectations, and then the lease company takes it from you. So uh, they'll list your lease on their website, they'll market it, and then folks can find that in searches uh, on their website. And they handle the insurance, the booking, the paperwork, the communication, all of that. And they just send you a check after they take their cut, of course. That's how they make, that's how they make money. Uh, it seems pretty simple and effective. Um, and it, you know, I'm certain it's a good choice for, for certain properties or certain landowners, but bear in mind when you, if you choose to go with an online lease manager, you're probably giving up some level of control and you're definitely gonna give up a few dollars per acre to pay for that service. So just, just keep that in mind. Uh, having managed hunt clubs and recreational leases for several years. Um, I can tell you both horror stories and fairy tales. Um, you probably all have several of those of your own. Um, but you know, you're gonna have good folks, but occasionally you're gonna have a bad apple. Um, so make sure that your lease has a provision for cancellation if things just aren't working out. Here's a list of some additional things that you'll probably want to consider when developing your lease and when communicating with, with your leasees. Simple things like designating which roads they can and cannot use and when they can use them. You, know, you may have a seasonal road. Uh, it's dry weather use only. Um, discuss your expectations for locked 
gates on access points. Um, Barbara talked a lot about that. Lock gates deter trespassers more than anything else. Um, so that's a big thing to make that very clear to your leases um, that you expect your gates to be locked. Um, you know, if there's certain places that you don't want your leasings to say build a, a tree stand or or plant a food plot, just make that plain. Just just tell them, you know, you can't do anything in this area. In some cases, your land might only be uh, suitable for bow hunting versus rifle hunting. So you just want to make that clear at least. State and county laws are going to prevail, but uh, if you only want to allow your hunters to shoot from an elevated platform versus a ground line, just say so. And if you want to limit the number of days that somebody can hunt on your land, that's, that's your choice. You can include that in your lease. Um, for example, most of my recreational leases are written to only allow hunting with dogs three days a week. They can still hunt seven days a week, but running hounds, they can only do three days a week. So you're just keep in mind you're free to set uh, those limitations as you see fit. Um, but just be prepared for the impact that that can have on your per acre lease rate. So in other words, the more restrictions that you put in your lease, uh, the, the less someone is probably going to be willing to pay for that lease. Um, if you have sensitive areas on your property, something like a stream or graveyard, talk some about graveyards or an old home site maybe, just set clear guidelines for how you want the areas to be either protected, avoided, kept up, you know, whatever it is, just set that out. In your lease. And if you plan to do active forest management, make sure that your leases understand the forest is not going to necessarily stay static. You're probably going to be uh, harvesting some timber. I mean, you're probably going to be doing some site. Um, make sure that they understand that they may need to alter their hunting or their trail riding plans uh, based on your forest operations. You want to prevent uh, creating an unsafe condition either for the contractors that are performing that work um, or for the leases themselves. So uh, one of the one of the toughest things that I that I face sometimes in, in dealing with, with my recreational leases is, is we move a contractor in and the you know, hunters don't know it. And then next thing you know, you're having a flash. So when it comes to managing recreational leases, I would say uh, communication with those leases is, is paramount to the success of a, of a good recreational lease. So developing a good rapport with the folks that are leasing from you and fostering just good, open, uh, frequent communication really helps mitigate problems for the developer. You know, just, just let them know, set clear expectations. Don't expect that they're going to read every line in black and white on that lease. They should, and they may, but just having those conversations with you is what's really going to help them understand what you're expecting. And if you opt to use one of those online lease managers, just, you know, communication, that's, that becomes their responsibility. But remember, they lose a little, little bit of control. There. And also remember, uh, your consultant forester can help you with that as well. And if you, if you don't have one, I strongly recommend fine. Um, so I hope that you know you've learned a few things about managing recreational leases and. There is an exhaustive list of uh, some resources that you can you can look up online. Uh, you can download one or two of them. Have really good sample lease documents that you can download, and that you can tailor make to your property. Um, pretty simple. Then the last link is that ACF, the Association of Consulting Foresters. If you don't have a forester, you can go on there and, and search in your area and find. It. That. I'll open it up to questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Sierra. Another another great presentation. Uh, let's see what kind of questions we have for you. So I see one. Um, can you lease a unit or track to multiple parties at once? 
I think the language, I, I think short answer would be yes, if the language of your lease made that clear. Um, so, you know, you wouldn't want to lease deer hunting rights to, you know, ABC Hunt Club and then lease deer hunting rights to XYZ Hunt Club and not tell them, hey, you know, this other club is also gonna, gonna be on here. I think not doing that is advisable um, just to prevent conflict. Um, but, you know, you may have different game seasons also, and that's perfectly acceptable. Um, have different crowds, different groups come in over the year in a different, in the same deer season or season. Okay. And there was another question I saw, it did pop up in the chat and not the Q&A section, but they were asking about the five to $25 range. Is that a yearly um, price? Yes, that would that. be, right. That would be, that's, that's for that most common, uh, which is the all-inclusive and the annual lease. That's a common rate. Um, I have not ever done short-term leases. Um, I have not ever done leases that were just for a specific activity. Um, so I can't really speak to what kind of rates you might garner for something like a, a horseback riding lease. Um, I really don't know. But okay. you know, consultant or a neighboring group or maybe another crowd that has done that kind of lease. Yeah. Typically, what is the minimum acres of land for recreational hunting purposes? Good question. I think that depends on um, what type of game you're trying to hunt. Um, I was actually in, in preparing for this presentation, I was doing a little searching on that uh, outdoor access website, searching for available leases in my area. And there was actually one on there that was for eight and a half acres. And it listed hunting, deer hunting, turkey hunting, fishing, because it's right on the river. So um, I wouldn't have thought that you could lease eight and a half acres, but apparently you can. Uh, I would say, you know, really though, for a traditional hunt club, you know, you're going to want to be in the 50 plus acre range. Uh, but I would think there are plenty of folks who would, uh, bow hunters, or turkey hunters, easily lease and hunt successfully on property in the rural Okay. I think that's all the questions that, that we had for leases. Um, if you guys have any more, go ahead and type them in the Q&A. We have time still. So if, if something, um, if you have a question for Sierra, feel free to, here we go. Here's a new one. How best to handle a farm lease and a hunting lease co-mingled? Yeah, good question. That is a good um, one. That is a good one. And it probably depends on which came first, the chicken or the egg. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I actually deal with that a little bit on the property that I manage because part of um, part of the property is in farm fields and it, we do have a, a tenant farmer that leases that um, and you know I, I think there are some protections in place I mean I don't know if you're worried about crop damage more or um, just conflicts between hunting and farming um, I will say that most of, at least in my case, most of my hunters are very respectful of the farming that goes on. You know, you don't, you don't see them driving through the crops or doing anything like that. When and if they do set up hunting blinds in the farm fields, they do it in a way that won't impact the farming operations. And a few times that they don't. Um, I just get a phone call from the farmer that says, hey, you know, someone has put a turkey blind up on this corner and I'm going to hit it with my tractor. Um, yeah, I'll make a phone call and get it taken care of. Okay. Um, here's another one. Does accepting money for hunting leases make you more liable or give you greater liability? It so does. Getting, yeah. 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 It does. Um, I mean, you're bringing people on your property. Um, they're going to have 
in most cases, firearms or bows or something that the shotgun, something that they're shooting with. So, um, but that is, you know, it's, it's very, very standard for hunt clubs to obtain that liability insurance. There's a lot of groups that provide that insurance. Um, you can look on, if, if you're lost and don't know where to even begin, you can go on the North Carolina Forestry Association website, NCFA, and they have a program um, for folks to obtain hunting liability um, uh, insurance for a hunt club. And, you know, I would definitely recommend talking with your own insurance agent and seeing if there's something that you need to add to your own uh, liability insurance policy that would help protect you above and beyond that liability insurance that, that the club is gonna bring. All right, well, I think that was all, all the questions. Thank you again for um, another great presentation. Oh, got ahead of myself. Okay, so um, a few things in closing. Our travel mugs, um, you know, we give away uh, two travel mugs each workshop. So today our lucky winners are, and I hope they're still on, Meg Everhart and Beth Rumor. So if you guys are still on, um, let me check and see if you are. Yeah, I see Meg. And is Beth still on? Yes, perfect. Okay, so we have your email address, ladies, and we will get um, those mugs sent to you, or we'll email you to confirm your address and, and where you want those to be mailed. So thank you for hanging on with us. We really appreciate it, and we just wanted to, to give you a little something. Um, we're about to do a bulk order for the mugs, so um, anybody that's interested in purchasing one, they're $22.50. That includes shipping and handling. Uh, you can make your check payable to North Carolina Tree Farm Program, Attention Forester NC and add Forest Herd Travel Mug in the memo line. And there's the address where to mail your check. And so we're gonna leave take orders from now to um, until April 30th. So we can, we're gonna do a, a bulk mailing and makes it a little bit easier. All right. So Deanna, so, we just yes. need to uh, remind folks, I've posted in the chat uh, the link for completing the evaluation for today's webinar. And I'll post that again since I'm just mentioning it. So folks, if you can click on the link there in the chat, that should open up the survey for you to complete. Yes, thank you for reminding me of that. Um, so like I said earlier, this is the beginning of the Protecting Your Woods series. Um, today was the first workshop. We have three more planned. So uh, come back and join us on May 13th for non-timber income and agritourism. We'd love to have all of you guys back and more. We love to connect with folks. Um, we have our, our Facebook page. We have our Facebook group that you can join. Uh, just search for Sir NC group. You can follow us on Instagram. And if you haven't already, join our email listserv. Um, we do, we are still under construction with a website and we hope to have that avail available soon. If you've missed um, a webinar, they're posted on YouTube. So just go to YouTube and search uh, Forest Her NC and you can subscribe and see all of the um, virtual presentations. Um, you can view them at your leisure. So thank you for joining us today. If you have more questions, please stay on and send your questions through the Q&A box. And like Bob said, don't forget to fill out that evaluation form. Um, and complete those questions so we can you know, keep, keep bringing you the material that you want to see and we look for any suggestions or um, just wanna make sure that we're providing the information that, that y'all are looking for. So thank you again for joining us. Please stay on um, if you have any more questions and hope to see you again in May.